I'm going to introduce Florian Eichler, who's our next speaker. Um, it's really hard to have enough time to say everything that Florian does and is, so I'm going to keep it short. Um, he's a pediatric neuromuscular and neurology doctor um, who takes incredible care of patients, regardless whether they have hereditary disease or not. He's also um, a geneticist and in charge of the Rare Disease Center here at Mass General. Um, he has been quoted by one of our colleagues as someone who does what other people just can't do. Um, and I've been very lucky to be mentored by him and to work with him on a trial that he's going to tell you about now that to me is sort of a story of how patients can drive research um, in a really unexpected way um, because of how motivated and how committed they are. So here he is. Um, the clinical approach uh, to CMT, and you, you heard about the genetics of CMT, and what I thought I would try to do here is tie things together a little bit in terms of why are we looking for these genes? Why are we arriving at a genetic diagnosis? What does it mean for you, and what can research now do, now that you've found the gene, and how has that got the potential to bring new treatments to the bedside? Okay, so to start off with, I just thought I'd show a historical overview of, um, for some reason, the whole slide isn't showing here. Um, is there a way of adjusting the, sc the, s the screen size? Let's see. Okay, while, while, while people are trying to do that, let me just point out that um, it was back in the 1900s that um, uh, Charcot and Marie first uh, and Tooth described this disorder, but it not until uh, the 1990s that we had the first um, a gene defect, the CMT1A duplication, identified. And then with um, ongoing decades, more and more genes have been discovered. And uh, there's one spike you can see here around 2000 with the Human Genome Project being published and then around 2009, with next generation sequencing, um, the, uh, there have been since then even more genes discovered. So my uh, interest was really in taking some of these gene uh, discoveries and saying, what does this mean biologically, and how um, can this now uh, help us lead to new treatments? And um, I don't know, is the te technical? Technical guy here, the the top of the screen is not showing. Okay, 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 good. So I'll 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 go with this and hopefully tell you what what you're seeing on the top of the screen. So I I I started to ask myself, what is it that these genes are doing, and where are they expressed in different parts of the body? And I particularly got involved in sensory nerves and, and uh, asked myself that uh, uh, where are these genes that are causing a CMT expressed in sensory neurons and what is the biology of the sensory nerves. And it turns out a lot of these sensory nerves have long processes that go out into the skin and those can be directly visualized as we do uh, skin biopsies. And uh, to my great surprise, what I found that many of these genes were under metabolic control. Maybe not surprising because there were uh, disorders that really mimic this, that, um, such as diabetes and uh, the impact of chemotherapy that were very similar to what we saw in genetic disorders. So what are hereditary sensory neuropathies? They're really um, a, a clinically in, uh, uh, heterogeneous a group of inherited peripheral neuropathies. They affect the sensory and autonomic neurons. And many of the, these disorders have been described in the past 10, 20 years, although most clinicians still don't uh, um, uh, recognize them. The classification that was originally established back in the 1990s still holds up despite the genetic, uh, the new genes identified. And, um, and this is just a, a list of the, of the sensory neuropathies um, that we know of, and most of them have now uh, gotten uh, uh, genes identified. The one I got most interested in because of a, a mentor I had at the time was HSN1, 
which really le led to sensory loss in the early 20s and 30s, progressive in nature. So to just show you how a physician scientist might think about this, um, I, we look at the different genes and we say what role do the proteins or enzymes that are now encoded by these genes have in the nervous system. And, and here, the, the uh, part of the nervous system that's of greatest interest to us is uh, a neuron called the dorsal root ganglion cell. And that cell really uh, sits next to the spinal cord and has a process that goes all the way up into, uh, into the um, uh, CNS, into the central nervous system, and had another process that goes all the way down into the uh, uh, extremities, into the skin. Um, and the gene I got interested most was called serine palmitol transferase. Um, we call it by a fancy name, SBTLC1. And um, as, uh, this is a, a, a gene that causes a disorder very uh, similar to what you see with CMT, but more sensory than motor involvement. And bear with me as I, as I tell you this story, because I think there are many similarities to what, um, what um, you might be experiencing or you might be hoping for uh, in your future. So this is a dominant disease that we see affecting every generation. Um, often the patients early on experience uh, sensory problems, don't feel it when they injure themselves, uh, um, incur burns and blisters on their hands and their feet. And when you look at the uh, biopsies of the skin, you see that they're losing uh, their, uh, their peripheral nerves. That will become uh, important for us later on as we um, are, uh, as I report what kinds of treatments we're undertaking. So this um, disorder had been described back in the 1950s, and it was noted that there was sort of a stocking glove distribution of sensory loss. Um, but then for many decades, not much progress was made until um, uh, uh, we here at MGH discovered the gene that causes hereditary sensory and autonomic neuropathy and it's caused by mutations in that gene that controls a very important part of biochemistry. And maybe coming back to Bethany, hopefully she'll take interest in the nutrition and metabolism, a uh, part of this, um, that, that here, this gene now controls uh, serine palmitol transferase. So each gene has a particular role in controlling one particular step of, of, a, of, a, of a cell function. In this case, it's taking serine, an amino acid, and joining it with a fat, palmitate. And by uh, joining palmitate with serine, it produces a particular kind of lipid called sphingonine. Now, you might say, okay, what does this um, uh, really mean for uh, CMT or hereditary sensory neuropathy? Um, and the same question we scientists face. We said, okay, now that there we know there is a mutation in this gene, what consequence does it have for biology, and what does it matter to patients and what they experience? And at first we thought, okay, maybe simply this enzyme's not working, so you don't have any sphingolipids. Well, it doesn't turn out to be true. And what we subsequently found out is that a new class of sphingolipids was being produced that was toxic, that was like a poison. And we were able to show that, that this poison was found in animal models as well as in humans and we found a way to reverse that. And um, so I'm gonna take you through this uh, story a little bit slowly, but I think it, it really illustrates what kind of progress you can make if you look at the biology and if you have willing patients who will engage and help you um, accelerate research. So I mentioned before, this gene encodes an enzyme that brings together an amino acid, serine, and a fat, uh, palmitate, and forms a sphingolipid. And uh, I, I, at the time, I was, I, I was looking at an animal model at mice. And you might say, why are mice important for research? Well, this was an, uh, an example of how mice really changed research because I was looking at the peripheral nerve of these mice, and I saw that there were lipid inclusions within the peripheral nerve of, of these mice. And you can see here an um, ultrastructural image, uh, EM picture, that showed uh, these lipids accumulate. And I decided I was gonna learn something that I knew very little about, which was sphingolipid biology. So I went to a Gordon conference and met a biochemist. And he at the time had just figured out that if you had a mutation in this enzyme, you produced these n a new class of sphingolipids called deoxysphingolipids. And these were 
uh, toxic and actually uh, turned out that, uh, that these were actually also being used in cancer trials. So I looked at our mice, and our mice had very high levels of these toxic lipids in their, in their blood. And more interestingly, so, oops, sorry, they were exactly in the part of the body that is affected in uh, this form of CMT, namely in the sciatic nerve, in the peripheral nerve. They weren't found in the brain. They were found in very low levels in the spine. And so we understood that this poison was particularly harmful to the peripheral nerve. Now, I mentioned before that actually the field of cancer had already discovered this. And now I was going to go on to learn something about which I knew even less than sphingolipid biology, namely marine biology. And here was uh, a, an Atlantic clam that ha was uh, uh, containing these toxic lipids that were found in CMT patients. Now, look at that. So this investigational uh, drug was then developed by the cancer field that said, okay, if this is a poison substance, we can use it to, to uh, kill cancers and kill cancer cells. Um, and when they conducted trials, they found that, well, there was not a everybody tolerated this, and most importantly, some had some acute side effects, but m almost all of the patients started to develop side effects of a neuropathy, a peripheral neuropathy. So this was another proof that this same toxin that we had discovered was harmful in, in uh, two patients undergoing this treatment. So we said, how can we change this neuropathy now that we have this insight? How can we use this information about the gene and, and transform uh, the disease? And we said to ourselves, well, if the problem of the enzyme is that it's now taking the wrong amino acid, and instead it's now taking uh, you know, alanine, and, and it's, uh, I, I said, sort of, it's sort of like the enzyme has gone promiscuous. It's starting to take a different partner. It should be always taking serine, and it doesn't do that. Now it starts taking alanine, producing these toxic lipids. Can we now force uh, the enzyme to take more of the normal amino acid? So I asked myself, can serine imp improve the neuropathy, and can alanine worsen it? And in the mouse, we were able to show that that, um, that the, the mouse, within very short time, became very sick and had a very bad neuropathy if you uh, gave it more of L-alanine uh, to eat. And on the other hand, if you gave the mouse L-serine, it didn't develop a neuropathy. <coughs> so at that point, um, I, I, I engaged with the family that we'd been following here from, for several decades, and uh, they were very excited about these results, and they said, how can we move this forward to uh, a treatment for us. And, and uh, um, you know, I of often tell my colleagues at Mass General, you know, the word patient is really a wrong word. Most of the patients I know are not very patient, okay? <laughs> They're actually quite impatient. They want to see things happen quickly and for good reason. They see day to day how they're losing function, how, uh, how there's one surgery following another, and how their own children might face this plight. So uh, we really started to working together uh, quite closely, and and uh, I I got frequent phone calls and wanted needs you know for updates and how is how are we going to make this happen, and what we decided <coughs> is we'll first uh, check whether these toxic lipids are uh, found in patients with HSN1, and and truly they are, uh, they're they're elevated uh, not just in in the family that I was following uh, in that comes from Pennsylvania, but also in, in, a, in a British family. Um, uh, so this was really something that was associated with that uh, particular gene. So we knew we had a target now. And now the question was, how can we uh, take the knowledge we had gained from mice and, and apply it to humans? So what I decided to do is pack a suitcase full of white powder uh, with serine and travel down to a family reunion in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, they let me through the airport, and I, <laughs> I got down into uh, uh, Wilkesbury and joined the barbecue, and, and, uh, and everybody who was uh, um, willing to engage got uh, 10 weeks of uh, serine powder. And what we found is that we could do this with two different doses, a high dose and a low dose. And with both doses, we could reduce this 
uh, toxic substance uh, into the normal range. And uh, you see here the, lo the low dose of serine, about um, uh, 200 milligrams per kilo per day, and then the, and then the higher dose, uh, double that. And when you stopped taking this after ten, 10 weeks, you saw that the levels of these uh, toxic lipids started to rise again. Okay? So this was nice proof of concept that you could actually take serine and you could reduce this poison that was being made because of the gene mutation. So um, what we then decided to do is conduct a trial uh, where we take uh, placebo and take uh, serine and do this for two years. And understandably, many patients said, why, why should I do this? I, I know how to what this substance does. I'm going to go out and buy this myself, and uh, why should I be on placebo? And this was, uh, uh, I this was really, again, one of those questions. How, how do you work together, and how do you arrive at knowledge, and, and what kind of time are you willing to spend to do that? And I think back to my old mentor at Hopkins, who had engaged at the time with a trial of Lorenzo's oil. I don't know if any of you know the old movie. Uh, with Nick Nolte and Susan Saran. So that, that was, uh, as I felt there was a story recurring here, is how can you, um, you know, do science and find benefit while at the same time saying, why can't we move forward if this condition is serious enough? Why do we need placebo? Well, it turns out some patients decided they were just going to take serin on their own. And this is one patient who, who did that. And within a year, we, he let me you know, biopsy his, uh, his uh, um, leg, thigh, and distal leg um, before and after taking serine. And what we saw to our surprise is mo none of the patients have uh, skin fibers in the distal leg, um, and a few are present in the thigh. And after a year, we started seeing a lot of regrowth of nerve fibers in the thigh and the distal leg. So that was very exciting. But again, it was only one patient, okay? So how can we conduct a trial, and how can we get patients to engage? And ultimately, what we did is we got support from FDA to do this because we, they s recognized the science was good, the models were good, the biochemistry was good. And what we said to patients is, let us do placebo versus serine for the first year. If you do that, everybody in the second year will get serine. And we talked back and forth about this at the family gatherings, and everybody weighed in. And, and in the end, we said, well, if it really means knowing versus not knowing, uh, it's really important for the, my own life in the coming years and decades, but also for my children. I want to have a real answer whether this works or not. And patients engaged. So, I think it was, it was really sort of an important hallmark moment um, to say, yes, we can do this as long as we're getting serine at some point. We are willing to get, do our part, uh, too, if, if you do yours. <laughs> so it was a bit of a negotiation. But I think, I hope this illustrates that um, I think in these rare diseases, it's really important to have that dialogue. Okay, let me uh, close here in the last third, maybe, with a few thoughts on beyond this one rare disorder, uh, but uh, are there universal things that apply to all genetic diseases, all single gene disorders? And I think, yes, there, is, uh, there are certain principles for single gene disorders that arise uh, from this story. I think if you know the biological function of, of the gene uh, that you carry, it, uh, it, you can inform research and you can perform proof of concept experiments, whether it's in a dish, whether it's in an animal, and you can, you can try to correct whatever abnormality is present. The next question you have is, well, whatever agent I'm using, whatever drug I'm using, does it reach uh, the peripheral nervous system? Does it reach the, the target organ? And I think where patients really come in is helping physicians understand the natural history of the, of the disease course. We need your experience. We need to hear from you what is most important, what do you want to have changed most, 
And what is a significant, meaningful change in your life that you would uh, be willing to have a trial um, occur with? So this, is, I think, is really important for clinical trial design to become possible. And um, what we've also found is that understanding natural history helps inform uh, trial design and the therapeutic window that's necessary. Many patients have uh, disease onset in childhood. Uh, by the time the disease has advanced, many drugs don't work. Others um, occur later in adulthood. And really understanding what that window is within which the drug can work is absolutely key. So many uh, new advances are happening right now for single gene disorders. And I want you to come, up, uh, come out of this meeting with a sense of hope that there, there are so many new technologies that are emerging that are of particular use for single gene problems. So there's enzyme replacement that's been around for a long time, but now there's gene therapy that is really going through a renaissance where you can either uh, replace the gene in cells outside of the body and, 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 and have them reinfused, or you can have the gene corrected within your body, in vivo gene therapy. There's cell-based therapy, there's chaperone therapy, there's changing the immune system according to what the gene is doing. There's silencing techniques where if there's a gene that's producing a toxic substance, that you can silence that uh, um, using new antisense oligo uh, nucleotides. And now there's gene editing, um, which I'll touch upon briefly. The key question is, are the disorders that we are um, facing and, and battling here together gain of function or loss of function? Meaning, is there, because of that one mutation, a, um, a, a toxic a, a substance being produced, a poison being produced, or is it a loss of function? Is it something uh, where a vital part of our body is not working because a substance is missing? So we're right now conducting a, a gene therapy trial for another devastating disease called adrenal leukodystrophy. Um, it's a phase two, three study of, of, uh, of s cells that are taken from the bone marrow of patients. You they're mobilized briefly. They, uh, they are then transfected with a, a virus that carries the correct gene. They get a brief uh, uh, period of chemotherapy, and then the cells are reinfused. And uh, we're doing this now with uh, 20 boys with uh, the childhood cerebral form of the disease. And it's a very nice collaboration between Boston Children's and, uh, and Mass General, and has now got centers all across the world. Um, we couldn't do this without industry. It's another important partner. And in, in, in the research uh, forum, and we're seeing that, that these boys' lives are completely changing. So it's really nice to see that I, I you know, 10, 15 years ago, I, I really had a graveyard clinic, but now I'm seeing the boys come in from all over the world, and, and they, they have lives that, that have quality, and, and that there's nothing more fulfilling than seeing that. So often I get faced with the question, well, diseases are rare. Is it worth doing a trial? How are we ever going to find enough patients? And let me say that um, with emerging therapies, uh, patients emerge. Uh, so I've, uh, uh, when we started the trial of adrenal leukodystrophy, I was told you, it's going to take you years to recruit patients. Within the first six months, we had 70 patients come from all over the world to our center. So this was really eye-opening to recognize that if you have a treatment, patients will rally and come from all over the world. So this is an important message for drug developers, for industry. This is uh, so important to see an organization such as this that really brings together patients and, and just the mere fact that, that you're all here in this room is, is so encouraging that new breakthroughs will happen. So I mentioned gene editing before. Concern in the past has been, you know, when you're de delivering genes, um, you're using viruses, and are those viruses having uh, having effects upon the body? Are they causing um, inflammation? Are they causing adverse reactions? Can you do it without uh, the virus integrating into the genome? And and yes, there are new uh, techniques, new tools that are emerging uh, with uh, with gene editing, with using tools such as uh, CRISPR. It's a little part of uh, RNA that was found in bacteria that aligns with uh, uh, the human uh, 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 DNA and, and then using Cas9, it's a, it's a type of molecular scissor that now cuts into the DNA and, and you can use this technique to very nicely 
uh, tailor uh, corrections into uh, the genome. I think in the next 10, 20 years, this is really going to transform the field of uh, genetic disorders. So here's a question from a father I got uh, two weeks ago after reading uh, this article in The Economist about gene editing. Does this mean that there is right now already an avenue to counteract HSN1 to stop or even reverse its effect on our daughter? And, and I think, you know, there are things that I've shown you that are already in trial in that we are doing with gene therapy, uh, lentiviruses, adenoviruses that are correcting this. You know, gene editing, I think, is still 10, 10 years away from the clinic. Uh, but uh, this is all happening. And I think the more uh, uh, you know, families and patients organize, uh, such as here, help uh, describe the natural history, help trialists uh, such as myself or industry understand how, um, a, how a, a benefit could be brought about if we correct this gene in a timely manner, I, I think it, it's going to happen. So what we've done at, at uh, Mass General is we've created a center for rare neurological diseases. Its mission is to eradicate rare disorders of the nervous system by using the bi biological insights such as the one I've described and help really bring trials to the bedside. And we're really doing this by uh, taking all the basic scientists and saying, say, behind what's happening in your dish, there's a patient, there's a family, and they're willing to engage, and they want to have uh, this move to the bedside. And we need all stakeholders involved to do that. So what we've really done is, is within this center, uh, created ties with basic science, with the trial uh, uh, center, the Neurological Clinical Research Institute, We've, we're collaborating with industry, with patient foundations, and we're thinking that this is really going to help accelerate uh, things for uh, rare diseases. In the first year, we want to really help translate um, uh, um, basic science insights to, to the bedside, uh, and I think there are a lot of low-hanging fruit here in the field of CMT. We want to mentor young uh, people and, and get uh, investigators interested uh, often you, you go through clinical medical training and you're told, well, these are rare birds. It's not really uh, worth spending much time on. But I think the opposite is true. I think that the strong biology here should be teaching us this, that this is the right time to engage in rare diseases. And we want more uh, young investigators uh, to be involved in CMT research. So we're creating partnerships with industry, with patient advocacies, and we have websites. So I'll just close by saying it really takes a village to do all this, and, and uh, we really in academia have to learn how to partner, and, uh, and we really need um, uh, organizations, foundations such as yours to also show us uh, how, to, how to move forward. A lot of this work um, it, you know, that I showed you was what could not have happened without uh, the help of the Neuromuscular Center, uh, uh, Dr. David, Dr. Fred, and others who really know much, so much more about uh, electrophysiology than I do, um, and um, my mentor, Bob Brown, at UMass Worcester, and, uh, and, and most importantly, uh, the, the Dieter Foundation, who really, as a family, uh, stepped up and, and really helped uh, me push these things forward. So, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>